then you move on that willing heart and you say, God, just take me, whatever you'd like to do in my life. Kind of like all of you this morning as we open up our Bibles, you're saying, okay, God, teach me something. I don't know if the guy up there standing and talking knows much, but surely, God, you know everything. And we want to hear from God. We want to know that the Holy Spirit of God, as part of one of the responsibilities that he has, because the Holy Spirit is a living, breathing, spiritual being that's within you, and he is God. But also, too, he has a couple of offices that he holds and responsibilities. He has character as the person of God in that triune being, but he also holds offices. And one of the offices he holds is to be the teacher of truth. He teaches truth. And when Doc Clemma yesterday was doing a little uh, Bible lesson in the investors' uh, breakfast time over in the, the, uh, the small group over there in the cafe, I saw he had a, a piece of paper out there and it had some scripture on it. And I'm sure he asked the Lord to teach, yes? This morning, Bobby, were you teaching this morning? The Holy Spirit, please, Lord, teach right now. The cafe, we want the Lord to do the teaching, but we are the vessels that he is using. And it's really an important part, as I give that introduction, to say, hey, Randy's just a vessel used by God in our missions, but he's a disciple maker. He is a follower of Jesus Christ and, and all the things about him. And, and then you relate it to the Word of God, and you say, oh, well, you've got this guy, Paul. Paul the Apostle, he's probably a pretty big deal. When you think of the church culture, you see here in uh, Galatians chapter number 2 that he carries a little bit of weight. And you find out that his authority in the church is as strong and recognized to be as strong as Peter's. We have Peter the Apostle. He is the one that God uses to get the church off the ground from Acts chapter number 2 and on. It even happens before that in his life. And as we've been already, we're going to finish up chapter number 2. We're going to cover verses 17 through 21. There's a lot here. And so these few verses, as we were last week, we covered, I think, uh, maybe about 10 or 11 verses from verse number 10 uh, down through, uh, or verse number 11 down through uh, 16. So uh, I'm not very good at math. Let me do 11, 12, about 7 verses. But now we're going to cover a few more. Let me just read a couple verses here in chapter number two, not our text, but just read a couple for preview to have you get a, a little bit of a historical part from the scripture, and then I'm going to add some pieces and parts to give our setting. It says in verse number 11 from our message last week, but when Peter was come to Antioch, remember now, Paul has gone with Barnabas to Jerusalem, but now Peter is in Antioch. Antioch is the sending church, and Paul and Barnabas are back from the first missionary journey, and now they're having an interaction. That's a kind way of saying they're having a healthy confrontation, a good one. It says there in that passage of Scripture there, in that verse, Paul, writing, says, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Verse number 13. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. As we spoke last week, here you have the influence of Peter, even influencing men of God, strong people in the word and in doctrine, being influenced by Peter's thoughts that, hey, let me bring some legalism into this sanctification process. Let me bring some legalism into your post-salvation experience where you're a new creature in Christ. But let me tell you, you know what you need to do. You need to keep a set of rules in order for you to really be holy when God's saying, you know what? You separate yourself unto me and I will make you holy. Because I will do it through the Holy Spirit of God. I will do it through my word. I will do it in a mighty and powerful way. And it won't be a matter of you just saying, okay, I need to fulfill a bunch of rules and laws. Peter is bringing that into the church. Let me read verse number 14, 15, and 16 just as a way of background. But when I saw Paul, of course, 
in Antioch, having this happen, he says that they walked out upright according to the truth of the gospel, which you know from chapter number one, Paul's laid out that there are other gospels, perverted gospel messages being spoken. He says, hey, when they're not walking uprightly to the court according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? You hypocrite. Verse number 15, which has a comma in it and ties together with 16. He's actually, by the way, Paul calling Peter out and saying, you're asking them to do something that you're doing, but you're saying to do the opposite of what you're doing. That's definitely one of the easiest definitions of hypocrisy. Verse 15 says, we who are Jews, Paul, formerly Saul, by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, so the idol worshipers, the anti-God people, the Gentiles. We know, verse number 16, because we're born again, we're saved, we're children of God, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. Anybody that's born again, anyone that's ever trusted in the Lord, sees that it's the finished work of Jesus Christ. We're justified by him. That's salvation. It's a salvation verse. But the other half of it has salvation, but also, too, the sanctification piece. Because he's not saying, oh, Peter, you need to get saved. He's saying, Peter, you need to get your doctrine right when it comes to servanthood. Because we understand and know in the Bible clearly that it's, for by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's salvation. The sanctification process continues. You being sustained, you and becoming a servant is the same way. I said it last week. You are, for by grace are you saved through faith. I put my faith and trust in God who has justified me. He's put the righteousness of Jesus Christ and imputed it upon me. And now I have this Jesus presence in me, his faith that's in me. So the second half of verse number 16 says, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. We're not going to watch and look and say, hey, you got justification because, hey, Mike, you know, you're doing a lot of nice things. You've got a nice little cool beard. You're really, you, you, you do some nice law-abiding stuff. You've got some good works. That's how you're justified. Uh-uh. Save, salvation, baptism. You make a testimony of the Lord. Now your walk is supposed to be, as it says here in verse number 16, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no man be just, no flesh be justified. You and I, we have some crazy ways of going about our faith because we're sometimes just a little lazy. As I was taught long ago and I've heard from pulpits from years ago, Bobby preaching and, and other people in my life, they often use this phrase, you need to stay with it. Just stay with it. Stay with this walk. Stay with the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Know what you have in Christ and go after what you have in Christ. Live in Christ. You're free to live faith. But here's you and me, if you can look up on the screen there. We kind of look at things and go, why did Jesus Christ die for our sins if <laughs> we could really work out this whole justification and redemption thing ourselves? That'll be the last verse we read today in our text. Because verse 21 says that we frustrate the grace of God when we do this. You see, sometimes, as a lost person, you remember, maybe you're just going to earn your way to heaven. You're going to be good enough. You're going to do your own justification and your own redemption. You can't. You can't. And then after salvation, you're born again, but somehow you keep on going back there. Paul's going to talk about that in verse number 18 and 19. It's funny how after this redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ happens, I think, okay, you know what? Christ had died for my sins and all that, but you know what? My daily walk has to be continually re-justified by me. And then I think about this. What is it with us that we are so full of ourselves that we demean and besmirch the finished work of Jesus Christ? 
We trash it. We soil it. We, we really don't, we don't really know him like we ought to, many of us. Because lazy. Don't want to spend the time with him. It's not the five-minute devotion and the couple of Bible verses and your laws that you have. and your, It's more than that. One of the simplest illustrations is when you guys really, really, really saw this woman and you prayed and you knew that you wanted to marry her. And so you couldn't wait to spend time with her. Chad, he couldn't wait to spend time with you. I mean, excuse me, Ray, he couldn't wait. Chad, just trying to stumble all over himself. Jeannie, oh, Mike, remember when Mike used to just chase after you all the time? He's not smiling. <laughs> you guys all laugh. And there wasn't enough hours and minutes and days in the week and the month to spend time with the person that you wanted to spend the rest of your life with. One of the exercises that I do with some of the people that I do premarital with is, I want you to make me a list of the reasons why you want to spend the rest of your life with this man, with this woman. Tell me, write down, why do you love her so much? Now some of you are running for the hills. You say, I don't want to be around her anymore. That's not good. Bobby's open for counseling, no problem. He'll be ready to go. You see, with the Lord who saved you, why should there not be so much more in relationship? That was our men's conference, and really what Pastor Rowe was led by the Holy Spirit to go after is, hey, I've got to stop demeaning and besmirching the finished work of Jesus Christ and just live right there and walk right there. And that's, that's what this thing is all about today. So, when you think in your own mind what it is that we have already covered, let, let me just ask you a couple questions. Maybe you can remember a few of these things that we've covered. Have I been saved by the grace of God? You would say, sure. Well, am I trying to mix law and grace? We've covered that a little bit. We'll cover that more in the next few chapters. We'll hit it a little bit today. What is Paul teaching the church of Galatia? In fact, what is he saying about rejoicing in the fact that I'm justified by the faith of Jesus Christ? Am I walking in the liberty of grace? Am I willing to defend the truth of the gospel? Am I walking uprightly? According to the truth of the gospel, the true gospel that Paul is saying in even verse number 9 of chapter 1, as we said before, so say I now, again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. What is Peter doing? He's messing with the gospel. Of all people. So do you think that you're above the possibility of having that come into your life, I sure know that walking through this study exposes us all into a place where we realize, wow, maybe I am more of a law abider than a liberty in Christ person. Maybe I don't really know the Lord Jesus Christ and live in a place where I'm really following after him by the truth of the word of God. Go to Galatians 2, 17 through 21 now. Put your focus there and let's read our text for this morning. That's a little bit of background as to where we're at. But if, verse number 17, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is it therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Now, real quick, just, just pay attention to something. Verse number 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a a transgressor. He's making this very, very personal. He's not really focusing on it's all about me. 
He's saying, I have to focus on what God is showing me and teaching me and that the Lord Jesus Christ in my Bible Institute time with him for three years, what Jesus taught me about the truth of the gospel, about the grace of God, about how I'm supposed to live by the faith of the Son of God. And he keeps on saying, I... Because verse 19 says, for I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Now we've seen that personal pronoun. Look at verse number 20, our theme verse. Even look up on the screen. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He's, he's putting down a point here. Because this is for each one of you and me to read it that way. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse number 21 starts with, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now again, Think for a moment with me. As we've read those verses, and that's our text for today, I want you to look up at that title up on the screen. You know the old phrase, wanted, dead, or alive in the Old West? Well, today it's wanted, dead, and alive. You and I are supposed to be dead to the law. Not supposed to, we are. We're supposed to live like we're dead to the law, dead to our flesh, dead to the sin, dead to the propensity. Though we know in this flesh dwelleth no good thing, so sometimes it's drawn there. Now just understand the depth of where Paul's at and where we need to live. We need to get closer to the Lord to understand that he wants us dead and alive. We're dead unto law. We're dead unto flesh. We're alive unto grace. And we're alive unto Jesus Christ. It's not that you and I look at each other and go, well, I can see that you're alive. Well, all of you from here, there's probably about, I don't know, 80 to 90 of you. Oh, I shouldn't have said that on YouTube. Okay, well, anyway. We're having a great time in the Lord. It's all good. Listen. I'll just... I came across a song recently, it messed me all up a little bit. It was just newly written by Mercy Me because the story has something to do with a real live person and a lot of times they write songs like that. And this song's about a person who is a friend of their band who got hit with some sudden, I can't remember what it is right now, and lost a couple of arms, half of his arms and his legs and, and he was supposed to die. And they wrote lyrics about, and the name of the song is Say I Won't. It says, today all be, it all begins, I'm seeing my life for the very first time through a different lens. This is a believer that got struck by something here in his flesh. Yesterday I didn't understand, driving 35 with a rocket inside, didn't know what I had. While I've been waiting to live, my life's been waiting on me. I'm going to run no, I'm going to fly, I'm going to know what it means to live And not to just be alive. This is what Paul the Apostle is teaching us right here. We don't need the lyrics of the song. You and I just sit there like we're alive. And I can tell because you're breathing. Some of you anyway. Being alive is one thing. To live for Christ is a whole nother package. And you and I fear, as we sit in a room like this, that many of us are counting on some others to really live it out while I just am alive. When God commanded us all by his grace to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. And that's what we're saying today. Even in the context with Paul saying about eternity and die, and there's much more to it, die to himself, everything. He's really saying what Paul's saying here. Paul said that in, in the, in the um, letter to the uh, Church of Philippi. He's saying the same thing here. 
I need to live and not just be alive in Jesus Christ. Dead and alive. That's the doctrine. That's the truth. That's really what's going on here. So, let me just walk through for a few minutes what verses 17 through 21 say. It says, commentary and conclusion. So here's Paul's commentary. Since we all read different commentaries, all you need to pick the Bible up, here's his commentary. So here's his commentary. He says in verse number 17 something very, very simple. He says this, God never justified sin. You see verse 17, you read it, you go, that sounds kind of weird, but it isn't. He's saying, look, hey, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? No, the justification comes in Christ. God never justified sin. God's standard is sinless perfection, 1 John chapter number 2. The sinless perfection, though, comes from Jesus Christ. So that's how God sees you. We say we're not perfect on this earth because we are in a terrestrial ball. I get it. We're here temporarily. But you, by the Father, looking down on you, through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the justification that he has brought to you, the propitiation, the redemption, the blood of Jesus Christ. Now he says, you have the righteousness of my Son. How many times did my Son sin? Zero. So God's standard is Jesus who is sinless perfection. And you and I, I'm not perfect, and then you start settling. I'm not saying striving to be perfect. You are be perfect in Jesus Christ by how the Father sees you. Now it's, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free to live because he loves me. Because he's forgiven me. Because he imputed righteousness and put it upon my account. Do you know what you have in Jesus Christ? It ought to turn us upside down. They had revival meetings 50 years ago and every person cried and got saved all over again. What's happened to us, church? Have we forgotten what we have in Jesus Christ? Because this is early church times. Don't be so surprised. It was happening there. Christ is the provision for sins. He's not our excuse to sin. That's what Paul's saying in verse number 17. Verse 17 simply says that our justification is in Jesus Christ and our justification through the works of the law are mutually exclusive. Christ is not the minister of the law. He fulfilled it. And when you put your faith and trust in him, But we can't throw the law out because the law does the work that God sent it to do to reveal to man that in his own righteousness he was going to come up short and his righteousnesses were going to be filthy rags and he was going to see his need for a redemptive savior named Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, we look at this and go, well, what's he saying? Well, verses 18 and 19, he's saying God doesn't want us living in a graveyard. He says in verse number 18, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor, for through the law I am dead to sit, dead to the law, that I might live unto God. He was a law of law guy. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Of the Gamaliel teaching, Saul, before Paul the apostle, was the man. He knew everything about it, right? You say, duh, I got that, pastor. But you and I read those verses and you don't realize the meaning behind this man writing it. It'd be like me saying, I'd rather go back and just go be in Catholic religion again. Where I can say my five prayers every night, go to a confessional to a man on a weekend, go to the liturgical saying of all the things that were being said that I did as an altar boy every day for years. And then realize one day it was hopeless and hard, but... I don't have against the people anything of malice. I, I relate to what Saul becomes Paul said, which is, why would I go back and rebuild something and live in a graveyard the rest of my life? I'm a dead corpse in the Lord, but he's made me alive. This flesh, 
we'll have a hole someday. Hallelujah. Because then my soul will be in glory. If you're lost today, your soul will not be in glory. It'll be in hell. And the graveyard will be the nicest place you'll ever, ever be. You see, the law accuses. The law condemns. The law arrests. The law convicts. The law sentences and executes you. But guess what? Jesus Christ fulfilled all of that when he died. Go check out Romans 7. Go out check out Romans 6. Go check out Colossians chapter number 3. It spells it all out. It's pretty good. That's what you have in Christ because Christ did it all for you. So how in the world could you and I think, as you get to verse number 20, that you and I could live a crucified life? Now don't forget, we've all taught this a little bit. Watch out now, I'm going to mess you up. How in the world could you and I ever live a crucified life? You say, what do you mean? This is another one of those places that we're just all messed up. Can you really lay yourself on a cross and crucify yourself? And why would you when he's already done it? Why would you say that you want to live a crucified life when you can live your life by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave his life for you? But no, we incorporate our own little laws. We incorporate our own little things. We got our little old ways. We got our little Jesus speak sayings. We got our little churchy things. And we do, I know I've done it. And I'm thinking to myself, God. This is the premier verse for righteousness in all of the Bible to counteract the Jews' premier legalism hold that they have. And he says the crucified life that you think you can have in your own and crucify yourself, you can't. It's impossible. So the Word of God says, it doesn't say to you, listen, my faith that I'm supposed to live is in the Son of God. No, the faith in the Son of God saves you. The faith of the Son of God, of the Son of God, sustains you. See, the faith that you have placed in the Son of God, in him, that brought you salvation. By his grace. But the faith of the Son of God, in verse number 20, that's what keeps you going. The faith of the Son of God, who loved me, that's what sustains you every day. His faithfulness inside of you is so mightily powerful if we would just tap Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit because of the promises of the truth of the word of God. That righteousness that's been put in you is by his faithfulness. And that's where you live. That's where we live. I know because I've lived that way and I've lived the law-abiding way. And I can tell you, the other way gets a little bit messy When I think of what it says in verse number 21, and I've joked about this before, all of us are good at frustrating people. I just have a master's degree in it. But I don't want to frustrate the grace of God. You see, the context of Paul is this. There's evils and dangers and legalism after salvation. Jesus Christ He's frustrated by a believer who would take and say, you know what? I'm not going to live in the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to live in the liberty of Christ. I'm not going to live by the power of the word of God. I'm not going to live that way. I'm going to do a Peter thing. I'm going to live morally and I'm going to live righteously by the dictates of the law. Instead of living free in Christ. You say, that's a mouthful. Peter said, live morally. By the dictates of the law, after he saved you, Peter the Apostle said that. Peter the Apostle was teaching that, and Paul the Apostle had to withstand him. Do you understand how easily this creeps in to all of us? Peter says, hey, this is where I stand until God gets a hold of him, and you can tell he no longer stands there Because living morally and righteously by the dictates of the law, instead of being free in the Lord Jesus Christ, will frustrate the grace of God. It surely does. Do you like to frustrate God? God expects certain things out of you, and you don't. You frustrate God. God expects us to live in the freedom of Jesus Christ. I pray you study, you read, you go into the Word of God, and you spend more time with Him, and not just 
take what I'm saying. If I'm wrong, then please show me in the scriptures that I am wrong. Praise the Lord. I'll correct it because I want it to be from the Word of God. Anytime I teach the Bible, I want it to be right here from the Word of God. And what it's clearly saying is exactly what Paul said. Why would I go back and grab up something I destroyed and make myself a transgressor? I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live under God. You are dead and alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just show you three simple things rather quickly. They'll, they'll hit really, really well. My first one I have up on the screen, you can see here, dead. It says dead and alive. Go ahead. Is the next one. Go ahead. Dead and alive. God wants this. He wants us dead to our laws. I put, I didn't say the law. I said our laws. Because see, we all have laws. I didn't say good rules that protect your family. We have rules in our family, you know. We're talking about the laws for your spirit fulfillment. For as Paul said, hey, you can't eat with Gentiles. Well, wait a minute, you were eating with Gentiles. Well, well you have to get circumcised uh, after salvation. See, God wants us dead to our laws, and he wants us alive in the faith of the Son of God. To be alive in the faith of the Son of God. That's when you're alive. People see you and they say you're alive. And then, if you go a little bit further, my life is one that is well lived. Because I accept by grace what God has done for me through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that righteousness comes upon me and it's by the faith of the Son of God. It says up on the screen there in Romans chapter number 3, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. All that believe, Jew, Gentile, barbarian, all that believe, all that come to the saving knowledge of the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, they call on the name of the Lord to save them. They put their faith and trust in him and him alone. The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all, it's by the faith of Jesus Christ. It also says, I put up two verses that are in our text right there. Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Right? We just read this. By the faith of who? Of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That faith is in you, believer. The faithfulness of Jesus Christ is in you when you get saved. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Who do you think is doing that work but the Holy Spirit of God teaching you to be and to have the ability to be more like him so that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Again, the faith of Christ. It's not, well, it was my great faith. It's the faith of Christ that you responded to that then you acted upon. You see, it's still his. Because no flesh need to be justified. Verse number 20, as I've highlighted earlier a couple of times, I'm crucified with the Christ. Nevertheless, I, we could say this verse a hundred times. It ought to be. Because it is the preeminent, premier verse about righteousness. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And what happens on the other side is that I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so that first, thing, that first thing is saying, look, I do not, I do not to be in a place where I have to keep on bringing up my own ways of doing things because it's by the faith of the Son of God. My laws have to be put down. I'm dead to them, but I'm alive to the faith of the Son of God who's in me. The second one, real quick, is this. Dead and alive. Dead to the law. Alive, I live by the faith of the Son of God. God wants us dead to our flesh and alive in the resurrection in Jesus Christ. Do people that come up to you as a Christian, you say, hey, I go to church. How about if you say instead of I go to church or I go to a church, which is good, it is cool. It's, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. 
I'm continually walking in the Lord and, and God's working in me. And, and I just, I love, I'm a Christian. I, I love, that's me. Well, I noticed something about you. Or it's the other side of it. It's, hey, because God wants us to be dead to our flesh, you're not always going after the fleshly not needs and wants. Like, oh, I need to have this, I need to have that. When people see that, hey, I, I, can, I can do without that, I can do without that, you're alive in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's when the light of God comes, when the glory of God comes. When you say, hey, I live in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I got it up on the screen if you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3 is really, really cool because Peter writes about this. And Peter, of course, we know dispensationally where this First and Second Peter are sitting. But he's speaking to some of these Jews that are converted and they're Christians now. And in 1 Peter chapter number 3 in the early church times, he's saying, look. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, verse 18, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the Spirit. Quickened, made alive, Jesus Christ once suffered for the sins, the just for the unjust, being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the Spirit, verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. That's the ark being filled, the eight souls of the family members that were saved by water, not a water cleansing but rather the water that God put them in the, the ark, the picture of? There you go. Very good. Somebody knew that. The picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therein, those eight, say, those eight souls are saved because the water comes up. Jesus Christ, as it says in Ephesians chapter number 4 and other places that he went to lead captivity captive, he preached to the souls that were there. In Abraham's bosom, there is a place that is afar off that are those that never received the righteousness of God by faith. Then there's the Abrahamic side where those that received that righteousness from God by faith. In the Old Testament, Jesus Christ went and preached to them. As it says then in verse number 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience toward God, which is the testimony of God standing up before them by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's your life in Christ. You live by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't live in a place where, hey, I need to have this flesh pleased. I'm dead too. Those old laws, I'm dead to my flesh. I do not need to please it. We live in the resurrection, so I'm alive. When you die and you're in Jesus, you're resurrected and you go to be with God. It's by God's grace, by, by God's faith, and it's imparted unto you and me. You say, duh, then why don't we live there? God wants us to be dead to our flesh and alive in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And lastly, something having to do with our identity. Dead and alive. Here's your last thought. God wants us dead to our identity and alive in the identity of Jesus Christ. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. I'll get there in a moment with you. 2 Corinthians 4 will end there. What's your identity? People say, well, God made me a certain way and this is just the way I am. Hallelujah. But are you talking about the sensual part, which is the, your senses, your five senses, by what you see, what you hear, what you smell? Is that it? Is it your stature? Is it the way you talk, the way that you make friends? Is it, is it your bubbly personality? That's the way God made me. Put that slide back one more just so I can look at, have him look at it. Your identity is something oftentimes that that's all you live and then you add God to it. It's the opposite way around for you and me. Paul the apostle's identity was completely changed from Saul, the righteous Pharisee. He was Jesus. He was a God, grace-filled man. He was a man led by the Holy Spirit of God. He, read, he wrote some of the most precious scriptures that we have that we're even teaching from right now. 
and his identity became Jesus Christ. Church, your identity the way it is is fine. God made you a certain way, and I know that. But God wants to make you his son. That's how he started the work on the cross for you to put your faith and trust in. But once that salvation and that new creature in Christ began, old things put it, passed away, old things become new. We just throw out the idea of Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3. We put off stuff by the laws that we put in our lives, and we stop doing things to our flesh, which still has a propensity and draw to it. But we don't put on Jesus Christ. The identity of Jesus Christ would just mess with people. Is God's standard been lowered? Are we just supposed to do the best we can? Is that really what Paul's saying here? I'm just reading the Bible. It says up in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 10, and there's so much here. I could read the whole chapter, but for time we won't. We'll highlight a couple of verses. It says in verse number 10, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. Manifested to be made known. The people see Jesus Christ in me. Verse number 11 says, for we which are, excuse me, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. You can't run from this stuff. You can try. You can close the Bible. I can close the Bible and not read it, not study it, not preach it. But it says in verse number 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us, raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. There's the resurrection, right? The identity of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the faith of Jesus Christ, instead of my faith plus a little bit of Jesus to get through this life. How do you get through tragedies? You put the last screen up, please. This is, how do you live beyond? You all do in some form or fashion. You get by, you survive, you do a little bit. There's more here. There's more for you and me. The better is the better in Jesus Christ. We are born again. Not just to be dead to self, which is important, alive in Christ, but we are to powerfully live faith. I am with this last comment that I said earlier. The faithfulness of Jesus Christ is so powerful that when you rely on that, nothing bothers you anymore. And then your desire is to be more like Jesus Christ. It's not that things don't bother you, but they don't take you down. They don't crush your life. Because the power of God that he gave you through the faithfulness of his son, Jesus Christ, allows you to have his identity And all the things that are around you that are going to go on anyway, they don't pull you down. You see, we are to powerfully live faith. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer. As my sister plays a little bit of music in the background, I just want to pray for you. I, Father, I desire so much in my own heart for the life that you have for me in Jesus. But beyond me, as Paul said, I, he wasn't saying it is about him. He said, I am crucified with you, Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, I don't want to live. But Christ, you, Christ, live in me. And now the life that I now 
to live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I pray that for our church, for the believers. Oh, God, there's so much more here. I pray, Father, you'd have your way. Break us down and build us up so that we can have the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Please stand and please respond. Please come. It's a safe place here. Please come and do business with the Father. Please come. The altar is open for everyone. Please come as God would lead you. Please come and pray about what he has for you instead of what you have for him. You say, well, I'm supposed to. Yeah. But he has his son Jesus and his righteousness for you to live in. His faith, his identity, his power. What a different life. We're free to live. Please come.